All right. Well, we uh, want to say good morning or good afternoon, good evening to all of you that have joined us today for this webinar. Um, we're really excited to be talking with the team that is working down in Antarctica on Weddell Seals. Today is November 4th, 2019. I am Janet Warburton with Arcus, and I will be um, hosting or I guess helping out with this um, event today. Um, although the stars of the show, hopefully you can see them in your video, are Bridget and Heather. Um, uh, company we today is Judy Fonstock. So if you have any questions, you can uh, send us um, issues through the chat window and uh, we'll try to address them as we go along. This event, by the way, is being uh, recorded and we will have uh, the archive online. If you have to leave early for some reason today, um, you can download the rest of it um, in a couple of days. Also this morning, um, Judy sent out an extra um, email to everybody that registered um, and it included a worksheet that Bridget um, can explain in a little bit, but it was a worksheet that will go along um, with this presentation if you have students in your class. Um, we'll also post it online after the event and you can access that worksheet then too. Um, as we go along here today, we'd like you to introduce yourselves. A number of you have been saying uh, where you're from. Oh, we do have somebody from um, overseas in Germany, so welcome. Um, we'd like to know who's joining us and if you have students and it just gives us a sense of um, people that are virtually present or uh, joining us today. Uh, so a little bit about Polar Trek and the programs. The reason why Bridget Ward is down in Antarctica um, is she's a lucky gal. This is actually her second attempt to try to go down there. She tried to go last year, but they was unable to do so. I'm sure the research team will talk a little bit about that. Um, but she's part of a program called Polar Trek, where we place uh, teachers and informal science educators with researchers like Heather um, in both the Arctic and the Antarctic for field-based research experiences. And um, Polar Trek is run by a nonprofit called Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. We're based in Fairbanks, Alaska, and Judy and I work with Arcus. And we run the Polar Trek program, um, and we've been doing it since 2004. Um, if you have questions during today's event, we hope that you'll type them in the uh, chat box. Uh, uh, Heather also has a uh, computer and she's monitoring chat and we'll try to answer questions. Her and Bridget will go back and forth as they go along, but if they don't catch them, we will also relay them at the end. And you can also, um, at the end of the presentation, uh, let us know that you want to ask your question live. All right, with that, I'm going to turn off my microphone and let this uh, go to the uh, team and have Bridget introduce um, herself and the research. So go ahead, Bridget. Hi, Hi everybody. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, so we are down at McMurdo Station today. Um, we are sitting in front of the printer currently, which <laughs> is, is, is working. Um, <laughs> So we are studying Waddell seal pups down here and how they're growing and their metabolic rates. And if you are following along with the worksheet, so far there have been five seals. So keep on going. It, it is in order, so no worries there. Uh, I'm Heather Lewanek and I'm the, uh, the lead for the team. So uh, this is, I got this project together and, and we brought Bridget down to help us out and to help communicate what we're doing to everybody. Do you want to give a shout out to her? She's on. What's that? She's on the screen right now, right? Who's on the screen? Sorry. Our artist. Oh, yes. And I know people were asking about the, the sticker at the bottom left of the, of the corner. And that was designed by Kirsten Carlson, who I believe is on this morning from Germany. So, hey, Kirsten. She's amazing. And she was down here with us two years ago and was inspired by one of our little seals to make that picture that you see in front. Yeah. That is cool. an awesome uh, sticker. Yeah, just tell me next slide, okay? So I know. 
Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead so we can introduce our team. All right, so this is our team. We have Heather. Uh, we have Linnea, which is another PI. We have our two veterinarians, Heather and Emily. Uh, Emma is, she in her PhD program now? She just started her PhD. And yeah. then we have Aaron Brody, our vet tech, and me, Virgil Ward. <laughs> Go next slide. Here we go. And these are the folks who were supporting us from home. Lars is also at Cal Poly and came with us two years ago. Sean Johnson is the director of veterinary research at the Marine Mammal Center. Sophie was our field vet last time and Melissa was a graduate student on the project as well. And I gave a shout out to the Brewster brothers who are engineers at Cal Poly who built us things to do all of the things that we're going to talk about, including measuring metabolic rates on seals, which hasn't been done for babies down here before our project. Next Thanks. slide. Another thank you out to NSF uh, and our contractors and our B009 team. They're really important to us because they actually go out and tag all our baby seals so we can identify them. Because other than that, they all kind of look the same to me. <laughs> uh, next slide. Oh. So you can see the tag on the flipper. That's what they go around and add to the babies so we can tell them apart. And, and everybody in the population is tagged thanks to this group. So this group has been coming down for decades to study this population. And so we know how old the moms are and how many pups they've had before so that we can make sure that we are working with pups who have experienced moms and that gives them a good shot at life. And there's their information if you're interested in following their stuff. Well, you can go back. It's woodellsealscience.com. Um, they have a really great website with all sorts of information about this population. Next slide. All right, so how did I get down here? Um, that's a C-17 behind us. Um, I'll hopefully be taking one of those back too. We actually land on the Ross Sea Ice shelf. So we're landing on ice but it's very, very thick, so we're really okay. Um, you also can t see the map. And I flew down from Massachusetts. I had a layover in Houston, flew to New Zealand, and then we took one last flight down here to McMurdo Station. And how long was that flight, Bridget? She doesn't remember. It was so long. <laughs> the one flight from Houston to New Zealand alone was, what, 17 to 19 hours? So, yeah, it was a long day, a long couple days. Uh, next slide. That's McMurdo Station. That's where we live. Uh, you can see in the background, there's a few buildings. I don't think we can point, um, but those are dorm rooms. Yeah, we're in. There we go. Um, yeah, the, the brown buildings sort of at the back there are our dorm buildings, and it's hard to see the big blue one in the middle, but that's where we eat, eat our meals, yeah, which are, you know, the two most important places. <laughs> and there's also the lab, which is set into the hillside, but behind you can see the sea ice, so that's actually the ocean back there behind the land, and that's where we work every day, but it's frozen, so we just go and drive out on the ocean to go find the seals and do our work each day. So this is where we live on the inside. That's a picture of my dorm room on the upper left-hand corner before my roommate moved in, which is another Polar Trek teacher. Uh, we have a bathroom with a shower and a toilet. Um, we actually have a TV and movie channels and a weather channel, which is very important to us. Uh, to the right, uh, that's one of our lounges. Every dorm building has a few lounges. That one is known for having lots and lots of DVDs. Uh, there's also a pool table downstairs and internet connection, which is really nice and slow. <laughs> um, in the bottom left is our galley. That's where we eat every day. It looks, it looks just like a big cafeteria. That's, that's what it is. 
We have a bunch of different stations. Like this morning, we could grab eggs. I had some pancakes. You can make your own waffle. There's a deli section. You can always have pizza. Uh, in, the, in the bottom right-hand corner, that's our lab. Uh, that's where we come back and we run samples and we prep for our day out in the field. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. There we go. Oh, so that this is what the weather has been like so far uh, down here in McMurdo. Uh, if you look at the blue line, it's the maximum temperature. So we've had a few days up in the 20s. It's supposed to be up in the 20s today, but it's just because it says it's 20 it's not actually 20 uh that's because we have massive winds around here it's always wind windy so in the green line is our minimum temperature with the wind so you can see it's much much colder uh the red one would the red line is just the minimum temperature without the wind so you could really see how that wind drops the temperature every day for us so i think yesterday's winds were up to 30 miles per hour? Uh, 30 knots. 30 knots. Yeah, which I can't remember the conversion now, but it was windy. It was, <laughs> it was pretty windy yesterday. Uh, next slide. So how do we survive out there? You can see I'm actually stepping on a scale in our lab prep area. Uh, we, we can prep there to go outside with all our equipment for the day. We usually drag a few containers out there before we load them up into our vehicles. But I wear about 20 pounds of clothes every single day. Uh, so it is, makes it hard to walk around. It actually makes it really hard to step up into trucks. <laughs> and, and <ride. laughs> Especially for short people like us. Yeah, yeah it, it's a little, you got to work on it. Oh, 30 knots is 35 miles per hour, guys, if you're not reading the chat. <laughs> so 35 Gosh. mile an hour wins yesterday. Yeah, that feels about right. Yeah, that felt, it was loud too. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. So what do I have on under all that thatness? <laughs> uh, so we wear a lot of pants down here in Antarctica. It's an ongoing joke in our team who has how many pants on. Uh, so usually I have about six pairs of pants on. <laughs> Other members uh, don't wear quite as many pairs of pants. It depends on how warm their body is normally but I have my regular snow pants on the outside where some of you guys might wear to go play out in the snow. I have three heavy pairs of thermals. I have one or two pairs of fleece pants. If we are snowmobiling, I usually put on a second pair of fleece pants. And right up against my skin, I put a nice soft layer because if you guys have ever had a lot of wool on, it's very itchy, especially with as dry as it is down here in Antarctica. Um, as far as my feet go, I every day I have a pair of hiking socks. It says one pair of toe warmers, but I've been amping it up to three pairs of toe warmers on each foot of days. So uh, I put one above my toe, one above it, below it, and one on my heel. And then I have a very thick pair of socks. And then I have my very heavy bunny boots. They're about three pounds each. Um, as far as gloves go, we have a pair of liners that go right against your skin and we do that so we put hand warmers in there because you can't put hand warmers directly on your skin and then a big pair of gloves um, and then I have my big red I have a fleece jacket under that every day I think everyone on our team wears a down vest keep our core a little extra warm um, again three pairs of thermal like long johns that you might wear and that silk leather to keep me not itchy um, a balaclava and it covers most everything except for right here. Um, a neck gaiter, it's a nice extra fleece layer, uh, either goggles or sunglasses. If I have sunglasses on, I tend to fog up so I, that I can't see. And if my glasses fog up, it then freezes because I'm in Antarctica. So I, I would have to take them off and put them up right against my body, which means I have to remove those layers to get them in there so they can melt before I put them back on my face. So I usually just have goggles on. Um, and then a hat. And believe it or not, we need to put on sunscreen every day. That's what we remind each other to do because we don't want to get our sunburn right here 
we also actually, the sun reflects off the snow and that's where you could really get burnt because you don't really think about it and you want to have your nose exposed so you can breathe better. Nice. Is that everything? Yeah. 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 All right. Next slide. What's our day like? Oh. <laughs> Well, some day, our days can our days can vary, but most of us wake up around six thirty, and we get up at or we get to breakfast about seven. We have our cup of coffee. We sit there, chit chat, try to wake up a little bit before we walk outside into Antarctica. Uh, 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 Bridget, you're breaking up. We heard enjoying cup of coffee. By eight o'clock, our goal is. Okay. So. Is this better? Is it better? Yep. We're, you're back on. Okay. okay. Great. Um, so after we enjoy our cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> or tea, depending or on tea. the team member. Yes. Um, then we, we head over to our lab. We get all those layers on. I'm the slowest at getting all the layers on. It takes me a good 20 minutes. Uh, but we also have to make hot water. We have to get our boxes all set to go out in the field with all our equipment for the day. Uh, and then we our goal is to get that all out of the building by 8 a.m. So And then we can load it up to whatever vehicle we're taking for the day. Uh, depending on what our transportation is for the day, it's either 45 minutes if we're on a snowmobile or two hours on a piston bully. And I have a couple pictures of those coming up. Um, when we get there, we usually settle in, uh, unpack everything. And by the time you unpack everything, um, it's time for a snack. <laughs> it seems like we just ate, but we burn a lot of calories here. So it's very important. We keep on adding calories to our, our diet. Uh, depending on what our procedure is or how long it took us to get there. We might even have lunch right away. Uh, and then we go to the bathroom, get ready. Uh, sometimes if we're working with one animal, it takes us about two to three hours. If we're working on two animals that day, it might take us four to six hours in the field. Um, in between there, we'll take breaks. So we'll go to the bathroom, we'll switch off jobs. If somebody's feeling hungry, it's really important and to get that snack back into their system. Um, I think everyone's wondering what you mean by go to the bathroom, Bridget. So, <laughs> going to the bathroom is not easy in Antarctica. Um, we cannot pee on the ice. So we have to pee in a bottle and carry it with us all the way back to base. So as you might expect, it's a little bit easier for boys to pee in a bottle than girls. So us we carry funnels <laughs> you still a little cold you're going to the bathroom um but yeah we we definitely have to carry those containers with us and uh walk them down the hallway when we get back <laughs> so they can go to the wastewater treatment plant that we have here in town because everything here we're trying to make sure that the environment is preserved so we don't want to put things into the environment that shouldn't be there including stuff from our bodies. Sorry. So you no, were talking no, about cleaning up, but I, I'm sure people are wondering. <laughs> yeah. I, for, I forget to mention because it's so normal to us now. Uh, so then uh, when we get back, that emptying our pee bottle is part of our cleanup. Uh, we also have to clean up our, our equipment and prep it for the next day for all the veterinarians. Uh, we download camera pictures. We actually use GoPros out in the field to grab respiration rates. Uh, we enter data into the computer, organize it in files, so it's easy to navigate later. And we have a nice little folder on the side of our lab for all our data sheets that day, so we don't lose them. Um, oh, when we get back, we also, I can't change it. We, yeah. we have to refuel when we get back. So like yesterday, we took the snowmobiles and you actually have to crank the fuel to have it come up out of the ground. Oh, it's still sore from yesterday. <laughs> but yeah, so we have to do that manually uh, to 
Otherwise, we still have to take our piston bully up to an actual fuel station. We have to enter code into a system and then just pump it like you would normally at a regular gas station. But it does take these little um yeah yeah uh, oh what you're uh breaking Kinda. up again bridget sorry sorry you're breaking up yeah. okay we can't hear you at the Not moment we're on the okay you stopped the video are you still there, Bridget? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yes, hear but we, yes, yes, we didn't hear Hello? anything. Uh, yes, we hear you, Bridget. Oh, okay. Um, so we eat a lot of ramen noodles. Okay, Bridget, we're on the snowmobile and piston bully slide. So where do you want me to go? We have a little cup and we put hot on it. Um, we were sitting through a chat. Can you hear us? No, we can't. You guys are breaking up pretty bad and we can't hear you. We're on the snowmobile and piston bully slide. Okay. Uh, I don't know if when you were going to be able to hear us. It looks like you can hear us. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Great. Awesome, guys. Um, so we were just answering the question that came in on the chat about what we eat in the field. Uh, so we eat a lot of ramen. Uh, we eat a lot of candy bars. Uh, and what else? Oh, sandwich. It depends on what we have in the cafeteria that day, actually, because they can hook us up with some really good meals. Um, I think they're vacuuming behind us. That's fine. There we go. Can you hear us now? Can you see us? Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, we just we need to pack things that have a lot of calories. Some of us, there are these little flavored tuna cans that we use that uh <laughs> That okay. we eat with crackers, just full to say. Um, so, I move on to vehicles. That, yeah. We had a question about that. Cool. So, these are our vehicles. I uh, we snowmobiles. Um, that's our one of our veterinarians on the left, Heather Harris. And on the right, we have Aaron Brody, the vet tech. Uh, so, well, don't worry, we have helmets on. We took the helmets off because we're not actually moving in that picture. Uh, but we'll either take those snowmobiles or we have what we call a piston bully on the right. It's kind of a miniature tank and it goes so fast. It goes up to nine miles per hour, which is why it takes us two hours sometimes to get to one of our sites to work with the seals. But we can make it really much faster in the snowmobiles. Our speed limit is 25 miles per hour on those. So that's over double the speed to get somewhere. Wait, which one? The snowmobiles only go 10 miles an hour. Yeah. No, I said the snowmobiles. <laughs> oh, the snowmobiles. Yeah, they yeah. go a lot faster. Uh, I, I think, next slide. Yeah. All right, so these are our two locations that we study animals. Yesterday, we were actually in Hutton Cliff. Uh, that's where we are working this week. Last week, we worked at Turtle Rock. People think it looks like a turtle. <laughs> to me, it does not. Do you see the turtle? The tur it looks like a turtle from the air, from above. Oh. Yeah. It's so it's, it's, it's a little island, and it is black, although half of it's covered in snow, which is what you can see in this picture. But it looks like a turtle from up above, like a turtle shell. And you guys can actually see the buildings that we work in. On the top, it's what we call an apple. It's a it's on skis 
So we actually can drag it with a piston bully, not that difficult. Uh, and what, what happens is we work with the seals just in that little container. I would say what that container is what, 20 feet long? The apple? The apple, yeah, maybe, maybe something along those lines. And you can stand up in it, right in the center. It's probably about seven feet high. And on the bottom, we have our hut over at Turtle Rock. And the hut is really nice. It's heated on the inside. And that's where we, get, we do our metabolic tests. So you can actually, yeah, there's actually warmth in there. So it's a really nice place to take a break. Yeah, is that it? Next slide. Next slide. Can we keep on clicking? Oh, the facts didn't pop up. There we go. Uh, so ironically, uh, Waddell seals are named for a British sealing captain. He used to hunt seals. His name was James Waddell. Um, fun facts, uh, they're the southernmost breeding mammal on our planet. They're all around Antarctica on fast ice. Do you want to explain what fast so ice is? So fast ice is the ice that is essentially attached to the land. If you think about most of the time when you see ice, especially in the Arctic, it's like the little pancake ice that's floating around the ice flows. But fast ice is more smooth. Do you want to see if we can show them really quick? Yeah, let's we'll see yeah. if we can show you guys our fast ice. So right out there is actually, that's, that's a sea, that's the Ross Sea, and it's all frozen over right now. And think about like your guys' lakes at home, how it, it's gonna break up in the spring and thaw and the ice won't be there anymore. So usually around January and February, it starts breaking up and all that ice will drift out into the ocean. And we have mountains right across the way. So that's what we see every day. Um, there's cod, they'll eat cod, they, cod, they'll eat little silverfish, squid, octopus, but they really like the krill, which is little like shrimp things. I think the silverfish are their favorite actually. Really? But everybody here eats krill, uh -huh. except the krill. Yeah, krill doesn't eat krill. <laughs> uh, so as an adult, uh, Waddell seal will get from 8 to 11 feet and up to 1,300 pounds. So they get very, very big right now. They're not that big. Right now, what, yesterday's seal? What uh, about 130 pounds. 130 pounds at three weeks yesterday. Next slide. So the Waddell seals uh, wean from their moms in about seven weeks. They have this cute little fluffy fur on the outside. It's called lanugo. Uh, their mom's milk is really, really fat. So way more than whole milk could ever be. Think about like even chunkier than like cream. Um, they're born at about 70 pounds and they'll gain about four pounds a day. So next slide. Yeah, I think you're gonna have to click again for the research questions to pop up. So we have two major questions down here what, that we're studying. Um, one, how do the pups stay warm? And how, number two is how they develop into amazing divers. Next slide. I hope you guys are still counting the seals. Oh, too fast. There we go. Can I explain that? Yeah, so we're we're looking at the early development of these guys. So these pups stay with their moms for their and then their offers they have them because really good care of them. But we want to understand how uh, we're breaking up. Yeah, that's why I turned off the video. I was a fair view. You guys could still hear us. Can you guys hear us? Okay, they say we can. They can hear us cool. again. Cool. Okay, that's better. Good. So, 
these pups are with their moms for about six weeks and then they're on their own. And we're trying to understand how they do so well in that early time while mom is taking care of them, especially how they're staying warm because they don't wear 10 layers of clothing like we do. They just have that fur and they don't even have blubber yet when they're born. And then um, as they learn to swim and dive, how do they they figure that out as little babies, especially next. Oh. Uh, all right, I'm gonna try to keep our camera off. It seems like if I do that, you guys can hear us better. Uh, they eat silverfish? Yeah. Silverfish and cod, for the question that just came in. When somebody gets a chance to change the slide, Next slide. Ah, there we go. So we have two ways that the pups are trying to stay warm or we're investigating how they're staying warm. Um, they have that nice fur that I was telling you about and fur traps that air uh, right against their skin, which creates like, oh, they can't see my hands, <laughs> a pocket to increase body temperature. And they also have a layer of blubber and blubber is just a fat tissue and that helps retain heat. And so that picture you can see is how much of a seal is made up of blubber. It's for these guys about half blubber. Yeah, Bridget and Heather, we can't um, hear you. Uh, you you got blubber. cut off about the blubber. <laughs> okay, so blubber it's a special tissue that's mostly that. The seals look that's a picture seal, but. What you see is how animals I do. Sorry about that, everybody. It's it's um it's a bandwidth issue at McMurdo, and we've probably tapped our uh, time <laughs> before everybody gets up at the station. Um, yeah. So just keep talking, um, as Maddie suggests. It cuts in and out, but sometimes we get longer durations, and then other times. Um, we hear you really well. So um, I think we'll move on from the uh, blubber to the next slide and we'll see how it goes. Okay, so this graph is just showing you how much these guys rely on their fur when they're babies because when they're born, they don't really have much blubber. The, this is comparing to a couple of seals in the Arctic harp seals and hooded seals and Waddell seals are more like those little white harp seals that you've probably seen everywhere. They start out with very little blubber and they really need their fur to stay warm. And so we don't know they do that here because it's a little different for them. They don't have some of the other tricks that those ice seals have. We can, we can go to the next. All right, so right here we are looking at our pups from beginning, comparing them to end. Obviously, the pups here are just starting to become three weeks old that we're working on. So we have a one week old seal up on the up. We're in his. 1.5 uh, centimeters and his blur is about his body but at seven weeks old you can see that they're much larger 191 to 310 pounds and their blubber layer has almost tripled tripled three point centimeters and their blubber is now 38 percent of their body next slide 
Sorry. Here we go. Um, so this is showing, oh, this is showing sort of the development of their insulation. We talked about fur and blubber. So they start out with fur and then they molt their fur. And that means that they just shed it kind of like your dog or cat will do after the winter time heading into summer, right? They lose a lot of their fur and they have a smaller layer underneath or a shorter layer for underneath that looks like the adult fur. And instead they're gonna figure out when the molt happens because it's not well described. And so that's what we're gonna talk about next on the next slide. Next slide. All right, so when we go, we, we call it a survey. We, we walk around and because of that B009 team with all the ID numbers on the baby seals, we actually can keep track of who is molting their fur and when. So we go on a little scale. If, if they haven't lost any of their fur, you can see the picture with the little cute fuzzy baby. That's a zero. When they start to molt, which started in yesterday, actually, um, they start to molt right on their head and necks and flippers. Um, we rate that a one. Once, once it starts to go down their sides, we give it a two. When it only has a little bit left, we gave it a three. And once there's no, no more of that, the new go left, we give it a four. So we just walk around, write their tag numbers down, and give them a number. And that data gets recorded into the system where we can, we can then share it with other individuals. Next slide. So the second question we're asking is how are they staying warm besides just using their fur and their blubber? What else can they do? Because Arctic seals need more than that. And we have seen the animals shivering, but we're trying to measure that. Do we have a picture of that on the next slide? I think on the next slide. Let's do next slide. Next slide. And there it is. Uh, we have an accelerometer attached. We just glue that on. And when the animal's muscle shakes underneath, then the accelerometer will register that and we can measure when they're shivering. It is kind of like a Fitbit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Next slide. So the next question is, when are they ready for water? Oh, we went the wrong way. Right, and so this is kind of complicated to answer, but we use, I think you need to click one more time. No, the opposite direction, forward. Um, we use metabolism to measure, oh my goodness, there it is. Okay, tap one of the and explain that on the next slide. I'm on the metabolism slide. It's just delayed on oh. the side. So just keep talking. <laughs> okay, well, when you were on it, it didn't look like it was filled in, but why are we measuring metabolism? Metabolism tells us when the animals need more energy to stay warm. Um, so when you need to stay warm, there are a couple ways that you can do that. And one of them is, you know, moving around, right? So when you get cold, you can start exercising and that will help you to warm up. Another way is the thing that we do here where we pile insulation on, right? Like we put more clothes on. 20 pounds of clothes 20 every pounds day. of clothes every day. And, uh, and so another thing is that just as mammals, when it gets cold, then our, our metabolism goes up. It's how we get our heat. And so we are measuring the metabolism of the babies in air and in water to see when it doesn't, doesn't cost them any more energy to be in water than it does in air. Um, I don't know where we are on the slides now. We, we should be on, on the one. We're on metabolism. Do you want me to change it to the picture jumping? Yes, that's what I thought we were supposed to be on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? keep on going? Yep. 
No. Nope. Uh, One more back. There we go. <laughs> so as I was saying, right, we can put on more insulation or we can increase our metabolism by exercising or eating more or just that's what our body does to help us stay warm. So next slide is how we're going to show you how we do that in our pups. So to measure mes metabolic rate, we actually look at how much oxygen the animals use and we know how much oxygen is in the air. You might not realize it's less than one fourth of the air that we breathe, right? And so we know how much air oxygen is in normal air and we have the animal inside of that chamber that you see pictured next to our hut and we can measure how much air the animal is taking, or sorry, oxygen the animal is taking out of the air. So you see that there's a hose there and that there's always air flowing through. So it's not where we just put them in a box and that's it. They're in there and there's air flowing and we're able to tell how much they take out of that air. And then we can use that to understand how much energy they're using. Next slide. Can I start our video up again? Maybe we can try. We're gonna try to start our video up again, see if that works. Can you hear us still? Yeah, we hear you great. Okay. Oh. We see you. Awesome. So our next question is, how do they develop into amazing divers? Because on top of the ice, they just look like they, they're just really big and they're just blobs sitting on the ice. It doesn't really look like they can move so well, uh, which they, they kind of, it's called galumping as they pull themselves across the ice. Um, but underneath the water, they are amazing swimmers. It's, a, they're, it's just beautiful. Uh, next slide. Next slide. I don't know how much the delay is. Yeah. Sorry, Good guys, way. we're waiting on the. It's okay. We're on the deepest dive, so just keep rolling. It'll show. There we go. Uh, <laughs> so they actually can dive about three quarters of a mile deep, and the amazing thing is they can hold their breath for up to ninety minutes, which is about the length of the Little Mermaid. They could watch that underwater. Um, and what's really interesting is they exhale everything from their lungs and they collapse their lungs before they dive. Yesterday I was watching babies uh, take dives and you could actually see them blowing bubbles out from them, uh, the water before they were practicing diving. So the seals are only a couple weeks old and they're already in the water practicing, blowing out all that air, getting ready to, to uh, dive. And their oxygen is actually stored in their muscles and their blood. Which is next slide, I think. Yeah, I think that goes in the next slide. Oh, the next slide shows you guys how deep they, if you keep on clicking through that slide. Okay, it's all there up to two miles. Uh, keep going. One more. There we go. There's our Waddell seals. So they're at three quarters of a mile. Uh, the deepest diving marine mammal would be the sperm whale. So he can almost hit two miles down there. And humans are up there uh, at, our, at our free divers at an eight minute maximum. So that's just a little scale on how deep the the little Waddell seals go, go. not little, but big, big <laughs> Waddell seals. Um, next slide. Oh, I keep going. Oh. Three Empire State Buildings deep is how deep they can go if you need a reference. <laughs> um, so this is showing where you're breaking Waddell up seals store their oxygen humans turn off the video mm -hmm. is this better yes it is better thank you okay so this is comparing where we store our oxygen compared to the seals so humans rely a lot on their lungs you can see almost a quarter of our oxygen is stored in our lungs and we have about almost the same amount in our blood but you can see that with Dell seals, instead of using their lungs, which they collapse when they're diving, they put a lot of oxygen into their muscles so they can exercise underwater 
while holding their breath, which is pretty amazing. And you can also see if you look at the very top, the totals, so they have more than four times as much oxygen stored in their bodies per mass. So this isn't because they're bigger, it's actually just per little chunk of steel, they have way more oxygen than their bodies than we do. Okay, you're breaking up a little bit, but just keep on going. Sorry, we can't hear you at all. We haven't heard you since uh, that last slide after you talked about the deep breathing. So now we're on dive behavior and we have two slides. Time to look at that. Okay. Um, one. Nope. You're broken up. Judy, will you type in the uh, chat for them? Because I can't type. I guess. Sure. Yep. I can hear you guys. Are you sure you can't hear us? All now, right. we, now we can hear you. Okay. Yes. Okay. But we missed the so, slides, so just tell us all about the dive behavior again, please. Thank you. So we attach little tags on the flippers of the seals. You can see it in the picture there. And it's right next to that flipper tag that we talked about. So you can see kind of the little number that tells us which animal is which. And then next to it is that little box. And it tells us how deep the animals are over time. And so we attach that to their flippers when they're one week old. And then we get the tag back when the animal is seven weeks old. And we can see what they've been doing that entire time when they're learning how to swim and dive. Next slide. So any questions? Now's a great time. I know we've been trying to answer them as they come in. And I also realized the bell just rang at Central High School. <laughs> so yeah. one question was how many tags the seals get? Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> not yet, no bell. Chris um, says not yet. So every, Every tag, we'll try. I'm afraid you're not gonna hear us if we put our video on, but we'll try. Every, um, every seal gets two flipper tags, one in each flipper, and that's the, the job of the other seal group that comes out here. And we attach those accelerometers on the side of the seal that we showed you. The time depth recorders on the flipper and also a radio on the done at the end of the season. So they don't get to keep their bling. They just have their flipper tags for the rest of their lives so we know who they are. More questions. More questions. Yeah, there were a lot of questions that came through what you were talking. Uh, Judy, were there any that you noticed that didn't get uh, unanswered? Are there any I missed? Yeah. Uh, you can type it again if I missed your question. Judy was tracking some, so go ahead, Judy. Okay, Kirsten asked, what's the coolest unexpected discovery that we made so far during this research? What do you think? I mean, I haven't made any discoveries. Well, about what we've learned so far. Uh, I, that's a really good question. I don't really For know. For me, it was um, that we learned that, so seals, because they were divers, they practice holding their breath on land, and so they usually breathe apneustically if you've ever heard of somebody with sleep apnea apnea means holding your breath so seals usually hold their breath they practice even when they're on land but we discovered and we didn't realize this that they're not born that way so when they're first born they 
they breathe regularly, just like we do in and out, in and out. And then by about three weeks old is when they start to practice holding their breath. So I thought that was really cool. And that's one of the reasons that Bridget mentioned we're going around and we started measuring respiration rates this year to figure out exactly when that starts happening. We think it's probably right around the time that they get in the water. So we're trying to pinpoint that a little bit better. I uh, have to say, I, I thought it was interesting that we actually use GoPros in the field. I was, I did not <laughs> expect that. I have a GoPro at home. I could do science at home. Um, but that, and the babies are starting into the water super early. I did not expect them. But Rolo was cool. A yeah. Week old. yeah yeah they get in at about a week old um or well between one and three weeks old but that's pretty young and it's pretty cool somebody asked um do they all get in the water at the same time so since we're talking about that no some of them get in the water earlier than others and the ones that are reluctant their moms often will get into the water and kind of call to them and try to encourage them to get in the water and start learning how to swim um one question is how long do they stay in the water that young? So they're usually in for maybe like 20 minutes at a time and then they'll get out and maybe go back in again. They dry off faster than you would think with how cold it is here. They kind of roll around in the snow and their fur dries off really fast, which is pretty interesting, but they do shiver a lot when they first get out and they're still wet. And uh, it was really fun to watch them try to get out of the water. So I took some videos yesterday, so keep following my journal because a video will soon follow on how cute it is to watch them try to get out of the water. And then it looks... I have uh, one question from, uh, from further up. Um, have you seen any live births or do you keep a distance during their birth? Oh, great question. You know what? We would love to see live births, but it turns out it's really hard to see. It's really rare to see it. So we've seen moms in labor and we've seen them right after they've given birth, but the actual time when the pup comes out is really fast and, and they don't really like an audience and I wonder if they see us around if they kind of wait. So no, we haven't seen it. Um, the other group has maybe once or twice in the many decades that they've been studying them. So it's very rare to see it. Um, I saw another question about if we're studying the seals predators and we're not. And actually one of the reasons that we're able to access the seals is they come in really close to the shore to stay away from their predators, which are killer whales. So the killer whales can't hold their breath long enough to get underneath the ice where the seals can. And so we don't see the predators right now because when they breed, they're trying to stay away from the orcas and make sure that their babies don't get eaten. Um, the pups vocalizations. So the pups are making noises now oops. already. Uh, to me, it kind of sounds like they're calling for their mom at first, and it goes, "Ma, ma." That's what it, it sounds like out on the sea ice for us right now. Yeah. But a couple of them are actually also practicing they are very interesting vocalizations that I cannot mimic. No, but they, they are, so at about, you know, two, three weeks now, they're starting to learn how to chirp. And then when they're older, they make kind of these, honestly, it's like laser noises. They sound like they're from outer space. There's a, there's a video on YouTube from 009, the other group that shows kind of some of their vocalizations. And one of our blogs has some of them too. They make incredible noises that we can't mimic. They don't sound like they come from animals, but they do. It's pretty amazing. Um, somebody asked how well they do once they've weaned. Actually, not very well. Um, they do really well before they've weaned and um, they only about half of them survive the first year and only half survive to the second year. And after that, they have an 80 to 90% survival rate. So those first couple of years are really, really hard on their own. And then if they make it through that, then they do really well for a long time. And they can live to be, I think the oldest recorded seal here was 31. So they live to usually be in their mid 20s. Someone asked the ice isn't staying as long as usual. You know, here in Antarctica, we haven't been as affected as the Arctic because we have the continent underneath and the ice acts differently than it does in the Arctic. And so we have not seen as many impacts, although this year we've had kind of a weird ice year because it blew out really late in the winter, meaning that all the ice kind of came away from the land and broke up and then it had to reform. And that took a while and it isn't as thick as usual but we, it's too early to tell how that's gonna impact what the seals are doing because it's, the changes have just started here. 
it is true that they're the southernmost living marine mammal, right? They're the southernmost living mammal, period. Um, yeah, oh, someone, so Kirsten asked how they keep their breathing holes open. So we are gonna hopefully post a video at some point on our Facebook or webpage, but they do a behavior called reaming, which is that they take their teeth and they rake them back and forth across the ice to keep their breathing holes open. And in fact, what else seals have two of their teeth kind of stick out a little bit to help them do that. And the older animals, you'll see those teeth worn down over time. But the moms especially do a lot of that because they try to create little ramps so their babies can get out of the ice holes more easily. And so they spend, they'll spend an hour reaming <laughs> to help their kid get out. We watched it yesterday. Uh, also, if you catch one, a mom sleeping, sometimes her two front teeth come out and she looks like a little vampire. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, does the Antarctic current shield us from global warming? Unfortunately, no. Um, the, even though we have that current that kind of goes around and it does keep the animals that live here from being able, a lot of the fish and things don't exist anywhere else in the world. It doesn't prevent us from getting the effects. It's still warming here and we have a couple of other groups who are looking at how that's affecting fish and invertebrates, which are part of the, the whole big food web here and are going to affect the seals down the line because these animals are used to the water being minus 1.8 degrees Celsius or 28 degrees Fahrenheit year round. It doesn't change, but it, so a little bit of warming is gonna be a big deal for these guys over time. Did I get that question? No, I'm just, I, did you guys hear all that? Cause I saw that we froze. Okay, cool. <laughs> Are there any more questions that we missed or you guys have? Um, I'm looking. I don't know, Judy, do you see any other ones? I don't know. I think they were pretty good about picking them up uh, as they were asked. So I don't. Thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm sorry for the delays. It's really hard to talk to you from the other side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did a great presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, um, to everybody that also joined from everywhere, thanks for joining us and hanging out with uh, the SEAL team here. Um, it was it was really informative. Um, and yeah, it, there were a couple of glitches, but I think we got uh, the most of it. And if people um, need to ask about some of those um, slides they know they can reach out to Bridget through journals and ask those questions so um and also our website is icyseals.com icy seals if you want to check out some more pictures and we've talked a little bit about what it's like here doing our research as well it's um yeah you can um yeah, Heather why don't you type it yep never mind Judy get <laughs> <laughs> lots of icy seals yeah <laughs> Can you tell um, us what you're going to do when you're done uh, right now? You're going to uh, go have your cup of coffee, and then what's on the schedule for today? Um, I have another Skype session later today, but um, we're going to be going out and checking on our animals that we've been working on. We're not sampling today, but even when we're not sampling, we go and check on our critters to make sure everyone's doing well and see how they're growing. And, um, and especially because some days we miss them because now they're in the water with mom. So we're gonna go make sure we see everybody and they're doing well. And, um, and it's a beautiful day as Bridget showed you. So it'll be a nice day to be out on the ice. Um. And uh, what was I going to ask you, Bridget? Oh, Bridget, how long are you staying there? What's your what's your travel plans? When do you come back? Uh, well, I really don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, there's there's no flights out this week. The C-17 is broken down. Uh, so that's going to push the next couple of weeks flights back. Who knows when? She's supposed to be here through November 13th, but we're happy to keep her longer. <laughs> but I bet her class wants to see her again. <laughs> yeah, so with this week, flights all canceled. We don't even know if they're gonna start landing on Friday or not, so we shall see. Oh, fun times, fun times. All right, yeah. well, uh, thank you again, and we hope that you guys have a rest of a good day out there. Um, and for those of you in it that joined us virtually, we'll um, post this recording in a couple of days and be sure to 
continue asking your questions and following uh, the journals uh, that Bridget's been writing. It's been awesome. And uh, yeah, it was good. Thanks, guys.